Okay, welcome back to another Between the Pages episode. And today our guest is Vince Lagano. Le- See, I got it wrong. Uh, <laughs> Say it Vin- like the Italian ancestors wanted you to. It's yeah, all Vince Laguno, um, <laughs> that's as close as I'm going to get today. Um, uh, and we are uh, here to talk about the uh, Unspeakable Horror 3 anthology, Dark Rainbow Rising. And ooh, yes, he has the lovely cover there. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to let him introduce himself now. So take it away. Well, hello. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm Vince Lagano. I'm an author, editor, sometimes poet, pop culture junkie. Uh, My jam is uh, books, slasher films, and Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, Unspeakable Horror 3 is the third in the award-winning Unspeakable Horror LGBTQ anthology series, and it releases tomorrow from Crystal Lake Publishing. Okay, so um, what inspired the creation of this anthology series and this particular book? Hmm, Good question. Uh, Back in 2008, uh, my co-editor on the first uh, volume, Chad Helder, who's a poet, writer himself, he had a website called Unspeakable Horror. And when my first novel had come out, uh, The Literary Six, Chad had interviewed me on the the website. We had become friends. And I I kind of remember which one of us floated the idea, but we said how cool it would be to kind of, you know, take this idea of unspeakable horror um, you know, subvert kind of the meaning and the double entendre of it and create an anthology. So he and I did, we put out a call for submissions. Um, we kind of, we had no idea it was going to be a series. Uh, we thought it would be a one-off. We subtitled the anthology from the shadows of the closet. So the theme was more dealing with the idea of repression, um, hiding your true self. And, um, we, called together writers from the LGBTQ and horror communities. We wanted it to be inclusive. And um, the rest, as they say, would be history. The anthology wound up being nominated for um, a Bram Stoker Award and wound up winning in the Superior Achievement for an Anthology category, which was uh, the first and only time that an expressly queer horror anthology had won. Sadly, it is still the only one that has won in that category. Um, So then many years later, too long, seven, eight years later, I had the idea for a sequel. Um, Chad did not want to come on board for that one, so I did it solo. Mm -hmm. And that one was called Abominations of Desire, which was um, kind of revolved around the idea of desire gone bad, run wild. Um, Same kind of call, same type of contributors. Um, It was very well received. This time, Dark Rainbow Rising was conceived more, was more of a timely topic. Um, You know, we're hearing so much today in the news about how um, LGBTQ rights, uh, people are, you know, it's under attack. Um, Folks send these politicos to Washington and to their governments, and they have these, you know, theological agendas, these conservative agendas that expressly you know, attack the LGBT community. So I kind of thought that we were at such a a very odd crossroads in our history. You know, we had had unprecedented civil rights gains as a community, but experience and those of us old enough to understand and to have lived through other civil rights movements, anytime this pendulum swings one way, it's always going to swing back. And I think right now, the time that we're living in, where we're experiencing that, that swing back. Um, so the, the anthology, the theme of the anthology was kind of um, about what happens when that pendulum swings back and how in the LGBT community, we're always, no matter how hard won our gains are, we are always looking over our shoulders in fear. So that was the theme. It was a little bit more thematically dense than we had done before. Um, when we put out the call for it, the interpretations of the theme are wild. And um, the anthology, which releases tomorrow, um, the contributors did a, a spectacular job of interpreting that theme, and I think readers are going to be very pleased. Okay, and that's an excellent segue into the next question, okay. which is, uh, can you give us a quick rundown of some of the stories? What can the readers expect, and what kind of horror subgenres are included? Ah, okay. So we have um, folks, uh, Haley Piper has a story in the book, um, Eric LaRocca, who is extremely hot right now. Um, we have um, A.P. Thayer, we have a newer writer named Yaya Schulfield, um, Holly Lynn Walrath. 
um, Matthew Blaine Hardung, Zachary Rosenberg, Lucy A. Snyder, who people will know from a lot of different anthologies and books, um, Paul Tremblay, uh, Caitlin Tremblay, no relation. So I thought it was kind of fun that we got two people with the same last name. Um, Amanda Blake, Sarah Tatlinger, um, so many people. We have um, two poems. Chad Helder did come back to write a poem for the anthology. And Max Gold, who's doing some amazing work with prose poetry, he contributed a poem too. So there's two poems in it. Um, as far as the types and the, the subgenres, there's, um, there's body horror, there's psychological horror, there's some um, what I would call extreme horror. Um, just it runs the gamut. It's got some nice uh, different tones. The characters in the book run the spectrum of LGBTQ. So there's a nice variety. I think this is probably our most diverse roster of talent. Um, so I think, again, you know, everything shifts. Um, when I did this in 2008, um, the people that were willing to be involved and to identify as queer is very different from 2023. So I think um, this anthology, this volume reflects that, that richness of the diversity. Okay. So how did some of the authors explore the theme and expand on it? Um, some, for example, um, one of the authors, I don't want to give too much away with regard to who did what until you read it, but um, one of the one of the authors um, revolved a story around McCarthyism, which I thought was a very kind of cool um, yeah. segue into what's going on now. Yeah, a very interesting uh, parallel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some looked at it from um, other cultures. There's a lot of cultural stories in there. Some approached it that way. Um, some approached it from a very literal sense of looking over one shoulder, the idea of, um, you know, being stalked or being paranoid. There's some, there's some paranoia in this volume as well. Um, so I think, again, it's a, the variety of stories I think is going to um, play well with readers. I think, um, you know, an anthology, let's face it, there's always stories you're going to like more than others, but I think readers are really going to appreciate the, the breadth and depth of the stories in this. Okay, so which story or stories stood out for you personally? Oh, that's like asking Sophie which <laughs> kid to choose, right? Oh, my gosh. Um, for me, um, probably, actually, that's a good question, because you're not asking me which is my favorite. You're asking which stood out. There's a story in the anthology by Michael Thomas Ford um, called Wishbone. And uh, Michael and I are, are good friends, and we've had some conversations. Um, we're of an age where we grew up at a time when um, AIDS had just started. So we were young bucks, you know, 17, 18, coming into our sexuality, and AIDS had, you know, now was rearing its head. So we were of a very strange little niche, lost generation of young men who never got to experience that sexual freedom or sexual, you know, liberty that the, our, our predecessors, who unfortunately then were the biggest, um, uh, sufferers in the AIDS epidemic, we never really got to to appreciate that. At the same time, we were also not the generation that lost so many people to AIDS. So in many ways, we were we were very lucky. So this story, his story, Wishbone, um, really hones in on someone in that age. The story takes place in 1985. Um, it revolves around you know family, and it really reflects the era of not being you know out. Um, you know, we marvel, I think, sometimes that uh, there's some stories in here by younger writers. And when you read them, especially somebody at my age now, you marvel at the the privilege, in a sense, that they have, that they can be so out and open and audacious. And to their credit, they've, they're living that gift. You know, they're taking yeah. full advantage of it. And it's, it's a great thing to see. It really is. Yeah, it is. Okay. So were there any stories in the anthology that surprised you? Oh, good question. Hmm. I'm going to run down the TOC and let me see. That surprised me. Um, there were a couple. There was one. Um, there were a couple. Lucy Snyder's story um, surprised me. It's called White Meat. Um, and again, I don't want to give too much away about it, but it was. it's a very, um, again, it's a body horror story. It plays um, into the idea of um, having to change who we are, having to alter who we are. Um, and I think 
I'm a big fan of Lucy's. She was one of the invited authors. And um, her story surprised me in its brutality. There, there's a there's a shocking scene in the in the story where I was just like, oh, she went there. Okay. Um, I'll be curious to see how it plays with readers because I was a little taken aback when I was reading it and kind of had to read it two or three times to say, hmm, okay. But it's it's a great story. Okay, so what was your favorite thing about editing the anthology? For this anthology, I would say it's the same as all of them. Um, I'm one of those very weird anthologists that like open calls. I've done open calls. I, this is my fifth anthology that I've edited, and I've done open calls for all of them. I love discovering new voices or voices that maybe aren't exactly, you know, this isn't their first sale or their first story, but, you know, this is going to help put them on the map. I love amplifying those voices. Um, so for me, it's the the sense of discovery um, of new voices and also particularly with the kind of thematically dense theme as this one was, what I enjoyed was the interpretation and reading a story and not quite getting it at first. And then by the story's end going, oh my God, yeah, they got it. They nailed that theme and it wasn't even anything I would even think of. So I think those were, there were really two surprises in editing it that I really enjoyed. Okay, so what was the hardest thing that you found about editing the anthology? The rejections. I hate rejecting folks. Um, you know, there's only so many slots in an anthology. I don't think any um, editor enjoys sending out those rejections. I always try to be kind um, where I really, it's funny because you can, editors can tell when writers are sending in a trunk story. Um, so the folks that, you know, gave the submissions call the respect to send in a trunk story, got the respect of a very polite, but not very um, explanatory rejection letter. There's other writers you could tell they really put their all into and crafted something specifically for this. There were a couple, there's one or two that I can think of right off the top of my head that were almost, and even one writer who I loved what he did with the story, but it just wasn't up to where it could be. And I gave him, I think a good page and a half of notes. Um, and, and he was very thankful for that. So, but he's still at the end of the day, it's a rejection. So, you know, I hope he sells it somewhere else. But yeah, the rejection, rejecting writers. I'm a writer as well. You know, I've been in anthologies and, mm -hmm. and I kind of do both. So I know what it's like when you really feel like you've written something that nails the theme and you think it's so good. And it maybe is, but it just doesn't um, fit. You know, an anthologist yeah. is like a museum curator. We're trying to create a, an atmosphere, a mood, and it may just be a matter of that the story's great, but I just accepted one with the same setting or the same characters or something and it's just kind of like you got to make a choice yeah yeah that that is the, the the chance you take when you submit to anthologies but it's nice that you give them a bit of advice and 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 a, a kind of a personalized rejection because authors always, authors always like that so um you also wrote the in introduction to the anthology so what were your thoughts when you wrote that I start off in the introduction. It's funny because I procrastinated terribly. I actually had most of the manuscript done, um, edited, and ready to go to the publisher. And the introduction was the last thing I did. I did it on a, a post-snow day here in Michigan in March. And, um, and I don't know why. Maybe it was just my weekend viewing the weekend before. But what happened was I had revisited the 2015 independent horror film called It Follows. And it was, um, there was some extra relevance because it was filmed right here in Michigan in Detroit. And watching that film, I really saw um, a, a direct correlation to the theme of the anthology, the idea of looking over one shoulder and that this, this insidious evil that you can't always define, you know, because sometimes, especially with politicians and, and people, it's couched in these, you know, very insidious ways and the movie just kind of bowled me over with its relevance so I kind of um, formulated the introduction around the movie it follows and made those correlations between how again even when we have these great civil rights strides there is always that homophobia and transphobia right on our backs following us sneaking behind us and we're always you know looking over our shoulder at it and just like just like they did in uh 
just like the characters did in It Follows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I read the introduction today on the uh, Crystal Lake Patreon. So, and you did an excellent job. I will. Oh, say. thank you. Thank you. Say. So, what do you hope readers will love about the anthology? I hope they love the stories and I hope they love the way that the stories as a whole, I hope they love the stories individually, but I hope that as they get to the end of the anthology, I hope they appreciate as a whole the theme and what we were trying to do with the anthology, both, you know, the contributors, myself, the publisher. I hope that they appreciate that and see the cultural relevance of it. Um, I think it's one of the strongest in the series. I think it'll, it'll stand the test of time, um, but we'll see. Okay. So what are some of the other projects you've worked on besides the anthology series? Um, last summer, we actually, uh, Rena Mason and I co-edited for the Horror Writers Association um, an anthology called Other Terrors, an inclusive anthology. And uh, that explored the idea of otherness and the other. And what was interesting was it started out as kind of um, like a diversity anthology, but we kind of crafted around this idea of the duality of the other and how sometimes the other, as portrayed in horror for many, many decades, the other was always the villain. And now culturally, we put the authors in a position where explore the other as a sense of both villain and maybe victim. Um, you know, and it was kind of uh, an interesting theme. It did exceptionally well. Um, we were really pleased. The, um, it got starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and Kirkus, which was, we knocked it out of the park there with reviews. And we were very fortunate, um, what is it, two weeks ago now? We were just informed that the anthology was nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award in the edited anthology category, which is the first time an HWA anthology has ever been nominated for a major award. So we're real proud of that. Mm, congratulations. Um, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we're very excited. And we, of course, uh, you know, are excited for all the contributors who now get to stake claim to the fact that they are in a Shirley Jackson nominated anthology. And again, some of those folks were HWA members who had never had a professional sale. So what a way to uh, knock it out of the park on their first try, right? Mm. Okay. So what's up next for you? <sighs> so um, I am, by trade, a licensed nursing home administrator here in Michigan and in New York. Um, and I've done that for 35 years. In the end of May, I made the very difficult decision to um, just leave my day job and I'm taking a, a summer sabbatical to work on my second novel, which I have been doing uh, diligently. One of the, the problems I think writers and editors like myself who carry the day jobs have, um, at least I do, is that, that sense of self-discipline. I've never had it. <laughs> it's terrible <laughs> to say, but I, I really, I haven't. It's kind of like when the mood strikes me, I sit down. I'm very productive when that happens. But this summer, I made a concentrated effort to get up, get dressed, comb the hair, brush the teeth, sit down at a certain time, keep myself in front of that, um, you know, laptop and write. Um, and I'm making progress. So we'll see. It's still early. We still got two months to go, but I'm hoping, to, hoping to get this one out. Well, congratulations on being disciplined. I have yet to master that. So. <laughs> I didn't say I'm there yet. I said I'm trying. <laughs> well, even trying is good because yeah, I don't even try anymore. I just like, okay, I'm going to write now and then that's it. <laughs> Okay, so I think we'll wrap the interview up here, and I'd like to thank you for being a guest. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank the you anthology. so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, the anthology sounds great, and you will find links to the book below, so be sure to check it out. And um, that's it for this episode, and um, bye for now.